Okay, everyone. So I'm um, going to continue now with the short lecture on architecture and AI. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Good. So do you see my presentation? All right. So we're gonna talk a little bit about artificial intelligence first. Now, what is artificial intelligence? Should be like the very first question that we have to ask ourselves when we are going into this field to interrogate it in terms of its application to architecture. So there is actually a short definition of what uh, in general has to be accomplished with, uh, with intelligence to, to, to be able to describe it as something that possesses intelligence. So there are three specific aspects. Number one is intentionality. Yeah. So uh, intentionality, for example, in artificial intelligence is designed on ideas that are based on real-time data that are, that are collected by sensors, that are analyzed. Yeah? For example, LiDAR is one of those cases that might be familiar to you where you have a set of sensors that are informing a system about its environment. And then based on this information, that system can have or create a decision. It has to possess intelligence. And that's a really difficult area of interrogation, um, really how to define intelligence. Yeah? But for this conversation, we're going to um, discuss intelligence in the frame of machines and not intelligence in the frame of humans. Yeah? So the scope of AI is basically disputed. Yeah? As machines have become increasingly capable, tasks considered as requiring intelligence are often removed from the definition, which is a phenomenon called as the AI effect, leading to the quip in Tesla's theorem that the AI whatever hasn't been done yet. For instance, optical character recognition is frequently excluded from artificial intelligence, having become a routine technology. Uh, modern machines' cap capabilities generally classified as AI include successfully understanding human speech, and you know all of that from, for example, speech recognition on your phone, competing at the highest level in strategic games, yeah, such as chess or Go. And we're definitely going to have a look into, uh, into the document documentation of AlphaGo, by the way. Yeah? I can also recommend that a lot as a on the sites movie if you're working, AlphaGo, the documentary, absolutely amazing. Another area is autonomously operating car. Yeah, and intelligent route routing in content delivery networks. So meaning, for example, uh, that uh, when you are making orders on Amazon, you get book recommendations and they're all based on analysis of your behavior and, and a neural network in the background and analyzes and understands your, your pattern of behavior and recommends books based on those. And of course, in military simulations. The intelligence comes into play when data analysis is combined with decision-making processes. Yeah? So that's actually where AIs are really, really good in. And the third one is adaptability. Yeah? So uh, what is adaptability in this frame of thinking? Uh, according to Anderson and Gronau, adaptability in the field of organizational management can in general be seen as an ability to change something or oneself to fit to occurring changes. Yeah? So Again, change something or oneself to fit to occurring changes. That's adaptability. In ecology, adaptability has been described as the ability to cope with unexpected disturbances in the environment. In the conversation of artificial intelligence, it pertains to adaptive algorithms, for example, road conditions, environmental considerations, and military circumstances where tactical decisions have to be made. So you have an adaptive algorithm that basically can understand changing conditions, like for example, changing weather conditions in a military field or just the changing condition of the road, is it snowy, is it wet, is it dry, et cetera, et cetera. Then the question, why to use an AI? What's the benefit of using an AI? Yeah. And there's a very simple response to that. It's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. What is meant by that? Imagine, for example, the production street of cars. And this is almost like an outdated model by now, but nonetheless, I'm going to take this model of explanation. Imagine a production street of cars that is outfitted with robots to weld the pieces together. OK? So um, 
Oh, wait a second. So to weld pieces together, yeah, right? So you have these industrial robots and they're basically welding points on a specific car. Now, when, you when you're changing the model of car to produce a different kind of car, uh, you have two options. Either you manually teach the robot every single point again that he has to weld, which is very laborious, takes a lot of time, and is not always successful, or you train an AI that understands what's the optimum position for those welding points in this specific car model and will automatically learn where to put those points. So it can adapt very quickly. So in, in, in theory, each, each single car that is coming along that production line can be a different model. Yeah, it will adapt very quickly to the circumstances through its application of a neural network and weld things together. Yeah. So it's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. So, and there's two specific trajectories to that idea. Yeah. One is called the generalized AI, and a generalized AI is what you normally see in science fiction movies. Yeah, so robots like in Ex Machina, yeah, or with auto mechanics, the, the, the AI being um, Agent Smith in the, in the Matrix, yeah. Or think also, for example, data in Star Trek, right? So they do a lot of things at the same time, yeah. They talk, they walk, they, they maintain balance, they can see, they can process other things simultaneously. Uh, they emulate human behavior. So there's like a lot of things that happen simultaneously. And this is actually a really, really difficult thing to achieve. I mean, what our own body can do is, is absolutely incredible in terms of complexities. Like, you know, you're digesting food, you're pumping uh, blood, you're, uh, you're, you know, you're breathing. Yeah. And you don't even think about those things, right? I mean, you, you, whenever do you think about that you have to breathe or that you have to pump blood, those things are getting automatically done. You're maintaining balance without, without falling off your chair. Uh, so all of the things are individual components, um, which are very complex and difficult to achieve uh, one by one, even less when it's all together at one time. So really trying to do this synthetically is something that we're probably quite far away from. So that would be a generalized AI. Now, what is the things that are currently being done is so-called applied AIs, like AIs that can do one task, but these tasks, they do really, really well. So what would be an example for that? Uh, of course, for example, the recognition of writing, or in this case, more specifically, the recognition of numbers. Uh, I'm going to show you a very specific example that comes from banking. It's one of the oldest examples of the use of neural networks, which is to train a neural network to understand handwriting of humans. Yeah. So whenever you sign a whenever you sign a check and you write numbers in a check, rest assured, no human being is looking into this check anymore. It's all done by machines that recognize the numbers and you know can electronically put them on your online banking account. So what happens here is that there's a huge database uh, of numbers. Yeah, and they're all they're all images. They're all pixel based. Yeah, and all those numbers written by different people, for example, are labeled a number. So for example, in this case, five. This, this image of a five is labeled five, yeah? So uh, if I create thousands and thousands of different, of, uh, of number five written manually by different people, I can slowly, slowly make understand a neural network through different filters, what a five actually means. What's the, what's the semantic information in that image? Yeah, the semantic information being it's a five. Yeah? Because those databases these days do not consist of a couple of thousands, but of millions and millions of examples, uh, these neural networks are increasingly getting better in understanding what that number is yeah? or what a specific number is. And in the same sort of frame, the majority of neural networks that are based on pixels work. So you have huge databases with specific semantic information so, which is um, labeled. And the first couple of thousands need to be labeled manually by humans. But then after this initial training, it's gonna start to increasingly get better at recognizing that and automatically start to labor. Another really important aspect in this area is the post-human perception of the world. Uh, I, I think this is a very fascinating problem we're currently facing 
is that machines are starting to understand our environment. Um, the, the majority of the work done at our own robotics lab here at Michigan University is making machines understand their environment. Yeah? And it's incredibly beautiful, eerie, fantastic, uh, colorful, trippy, um, uh, spooky, all of those things at the same time. I think those, this is fantastic that suddenly machines are seeing the world in a completely different way than we as humans do. And um, this is again a lighter image here, as the same with this next image, it's all lighter images. So a combination between laser, radar, and visual information that is connected together to get a machine information about the environment. And you remember about what actually was the definition of intelligence is also this, 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 this uh, idea of understanding its surrounding in a specific way. Um, so apart from being interesting in terms of, of its ontological qualities of, of the becoming of a visual, a visual impression of the world, it at the same time represents an, an, an epistemological problem in what do I as a human understand out of that condition? It's a big question anyways, whether we're supposed to understand, by the way, this condition entirely, or if this is just an environment that should be understood by machines only. Sounds like science fiction, but I can tell you we're right in the middle of that in our own reality currently. So let's talk a little bit about AI and creativity. So the question here is, can AIs be creative? And this is something that I've been discussing with friends now for a couple of years, um, with a lot of different opinions about it. Some say yes, some say no. I have my position is 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 some is 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 uh, kind of uh, oscillating uh, based on the information that I have. Yeah, but I can show you one example which brought me, you know, where I started to think about the problem more deeply. What you see here is the so-called uh, Alice and Bob experiment, which was done by the Facebook Artificial Intelligence Research Unit, um, 2017. Yeah. And the experiment was as follows. They created two neural networks. So let, let me start earlier than that. Um, the research group was tasked with the, with, the, uh, with, the, um, with, with the problem to create an AI that can respond to telephone calls uh, of bank users who want to have information about different offerings that the bank can offer in their businesses. And the idea was to create an AI that is so good that the person, the real person on the other end of the line would not recognize that it's actually not a human being. Yeah. Uh, and so these guys at Facebook Artificial Intelligence Research Unit set up an experiment. They made two neural networks that were supposed to discuss with each other problems of banking and economy in order to train each other better so that they can have a more eff efficient AI at the end when it had to respond to a human agent. So these guys run the program, go out of the lab, run it, run overnight, come back, and the next day the AIs had developed their own language. Yeah, uh, that's what you see here. And um, what I read was that the AIs generated a language or invented a language in order to be more efficient in discussing economic problems, yeah? uh, which was quite in incredible. I thought that's incredible because that's actually proof that AIs can be creative because inventing a language is a creative process. Uh, I, I remember seeing this the first time in 2017. Today, I'm not so sure anymore whether that what I was thinking is true because what you see here as language is based on English, right? So they took something that they know and applied that to their problem. And then what comes out of this is not legible for humans in the sense that we cannot make sense out of it, yeah? So we don't know whether what they're discussing here is really more efficient or not. We just know that they're discussing something. Seems to me at least like that. I think it needs more information and more analysis to understand whether this was really a genuinely creative process or if it was just a mistake in the code that created a random language output. So I don't know yet exactly. I need to research it a little bit better, but I think it's a fascinating problem. Now for machine hallucinations. If machines have a certain um, 
amount of creativity, or even if they don't, there are certain processes that we're using in, in uh, machine learning processes that are based on our very narrow understanding of how our brain works. And one, is, one of those is what I described as machine hallucinations. So here's what's, what's, what you have to know about terms like hallucinating, vision, uh, dreaming, uh, terms that are getting used in AI research are basically terms that AI research borrowed from neuroscience. neuroscience. And the reason they borrowed those terms from neuroscience is that we actually, we actually don't know exactly how our brain works. Yeah? There is no real evidence to make that understandable for us completely. But, uh, but what we know is that um, certain things that happen in our brain um, can be manifested as mathematical problems that we can apply to a neural network. So we do understand, we have fairly basic understanding, for example, how dreaming works in our brain. We have a sort of an understanding how hallucination works in our brain. Uh, for example, drug-induced hallucinations is something that has been researched quite a lot. And there seems to be an, an understanding of how that works. And we can cast those things now into mathematical formula. And that's how we can apply them to, uh, uh, to something like a neural network. Yeah, so they're all based on math. Okay, so what you see here, um, this is the result from a, a project that was done in my thesis studio um, uh, two years ago by Hannah Dougherty, Mariana Moreira de Calvaro, and Iman Suleiman, who uh, um, made an image classification using convolutional neural networks, uh, specifically doing deep learning in Python. Yeah. Uh, and so they had they defined a set of target classes, objects to identify an image, and trained the model to recognize them using labeled example photos. Yeah. And that's where I was saying before already about, remember that example with the numbers? So what they were doing is instead of creating, you know, using um, images with numbers, they actually started to use images with very specific architectural um, elements, yeah, to do this image classification process. And what they did is they created these huge databases of architectural features, doors, columns, arches, uh, stairs, uh, and facades, like thousands and thousands of images that they manually labeled also to make this process work. What I thought was pretty ingenious in this case was that they made one class, yeah, let me point this out to you, this one here, yeah, that class is their own renderings. So um, in an early process in my thesis studio, students normally learn to uh, at least like a really quick and dirty way of how to use Maya and especially to use Maya for creating specific patterns. And these students create an, a huge database of their own renderings with these patterns. And once they have all these classifications, they can start to dream yeah, that uh, the quality of their own patterns onto existing architecture. This is one of those examples where you see on the left, you see the starting image with one of their own patterns. And on the right, you see the result of the dreaming process where it was overlaid over, uh, I think, a Baroque church image, a Rococo, actually. Um, and, and this is where it becomes interesting to me because the cool thing about these results is that they're neither Baroque, or Rococo, nor are they their, their pattern. It's something different, new, unexpected, strange, beautiful, grotesque. Like there's a variety of possibilities to describe this. But in any case, it's novel. It's something that you did not think beforehand to do. It, it, it's really part of an emerging process that was uh, uh, achieved by using a neural network. Another uh, area of exploration, again, by Hannah, uh, Mariana, and Iman, was uh, really using deep dreaming. And deep dreaming is, um, is exactly what I was describing before about reversing the flow of information within a neural network. 
so deep dreaming is basically using a generative adversarial network, yeah, uh, which normally would, for example, would be used to recognize to recognize features in the world. It's what is used a lot, for example, when it is about automated cars. Yeah, so when a car has to recognize other cars, uh, people on the street, uh, the border of the street, street signs, and so on, you use generative adversarial networks that are trained. Uh, with the databases I mentioned before about recognizing those specific features, right? But you can also use it in a reverse mode. And what happens then is things like this. So from a distance, you will recognize that this is a Van Gogh self-portrait. Van Gogh is a very, very popular victim in this sort of experiments. It seems to work particularly well in terms of dreaming on top of it. So what's happening here is that when you reverse the, the flow of information in a GAN, a GAN understands the world only based on the databases it's feeded. So when you get him a painting, a portrait, when you get him to look at a portrait um, of Van Gogh, what, it's got, what it's going to start to see are what, their data, what the databases are this GAN is based on. So this GAN, for example, had obviously a database that is based on birds and lizards, yeah? So when it looks into a portrait of Van Gogh, it's trying to make sense of the world in, in the sense that it starts to see, to tries to recognize where are lizards and birds in this image. So it's trying to make sense of the world based on its information, on the information it has. That's why it sees only birds and lizards, yeah? That's how these really strange uh, images start to emerge. Now, another technique is style transfer, where you take a specific, you have a, a target image and you have a style image, and through a transformation using a, a generative adversarial network, you can transform the style from one image to a target image. Again, using Van Gogh, as I said, a very popular victim, you can take a completely conventional image on the left of a, of, a, of a town as a target, and then you use the Van Gogh Starry Night in the middle as the style, and this will generate an image uh, in the style of Van Gogh. Uh, the, the interesting part here is that those that artworks that are coming out of these ideas are starting to really uh, gain traction in terms of recognition as pieces of art. Yeah. So for example, this here is an artwork created by the Paris-based art collective Obvious. We're using artificial intelligence and that was sold at, at Christie's yeah, uh, for about half a million dollars last year. And the, the most fascinating part about this is that um, it was recognized as the first piece of art that was actually generated by um, an artificial intelligence. So this is proof that the, the, the plateau, uh, oh, let me put it this way, that um, human agency is not anymore like a pyramid where human agency is on the top and then anything is below that, but rather that we have now a plateau where there's different players on the same level, meaning that you have human agency, you have AI agency, and they're sort of somehow communicating here. But this whole problem is far deeper than you think because it's not only about did an AI do a piece of art? There is a lot of aspects of agency um, and authorship involved here. For example, the image is based on a database of uh, portraits of Western, made in Western art from the Middle Ages to today, or to the, I would say, turn of the century. Yeah? I have the suspicion, by the way, that this database is actually smaller, that it's actually only dealing with portraits from around the 1600s to, to around 1900, because of the very specific way this portrait looks in terms of color and, and, and pose and so on. It's very much influenced by Dutch uh, painting of the 17th century. In any case, there's other questions here. Like for example, who is the real author of this painting? The massive amount of painters whose images were used to create the database, or the artist who used a neural network to create the piece, or the person who coded the code. Because the artist didn't code the code. The code was done by somebody else before. Yeah? 
So there is like a whole universe of things happening here, <clears throat> which, by the way, also talks a lot about the problem uh, of bias in, in artificial intelligence. Yeah. So, um, for example, this portrait only used Western art as the database. Why did it only use Western art? Why didn't it use Eastern art or African art or Latin American art? Only European art? I don't know exactly, but this is already telling a lot about bias in terms of people using AI. Yeah? So you can tweak AI to behave in a way that will prefer specific cultural circumstances. Yeah? And this is also something we need to discuss in a bit more extent within this course. Very interesting problem. All right, now talk about talking about architecture yeah? and AI. Finally getting there. Sorry, it took a while, but finally getting to architecture. Um, you, you, heard me you heard me saying a couple of times style, style transfer, and so on. So there is definitely the use of style as an idea present in contemporary use of artificial intelligence. And what I'm showing you here is the book uh, Style by Gottfried Semper, uh, which, uh, you know, German architect and theorist who published this immense, you know, gigantic work um, called uh, The uh, Style of the Technical and Tectonic Arts uh, or Practical Aesthetics. Yeah? So it, this was basically considered as a handbook for technicians, artists, and friends of art. And uh, uh, it, it became sort of a, a really interesting um, proto example of materialist thinking in architecture in that he used specific ideas of materials and the way how they are represented in architecture as a starting point for speculating about style in architecture. So this particular tome of style is considering problems of textiles in the arts, yeah? And especially, specifically also textiles in architecture. Uh, I think one of the ideas he has is that the tent is basically one of the most archaic things we know in terms of architecture. And the textiles somehow were translated later on in, for example, stone to represent um, um, an architectural device. Yeah? They were parts of architecture, but more like a decoration. Uh, I, I'm not gonna repeat the entire book. It's a fascinating book. I can really recommend it to you. But anyways, does, does it mean that as we're currently talking about style transfer in architecture, is there aspects of style returning into the discussion of architecture? And if it is doing so, how? And, how, and, and does it have any importance? Let me show you an example of style transfer in architecture. So you know all this, this very the iconic repeating facade of Hong Kong towers, for example. Uh, and uh, on the opposite end of articulation, uh, this is a, um, a Baroque church uh, in Germany. And when you start to create a style transfer between the two, you get results like this, which is neither nor. It's not really Baroque, but it's not really modern either. Uh, this is also something that you could use when you are tweaking the weights. You will also see how different styles become more or less dominant. So it could be that the, the modern repetitive facade can be more dominant than the Baroque one and vice versa. Uh, my office span, we applied this technique successfully the first time around in 2018 when we created this competition entry for um, the Austrian Pavilion at the Expo in Dubai, where we used uh, a style transfer technique to create the ceiling. And we had the first clumsy attempts to create like a three-dimensional model out of that, uh, which was more or less successful. I actually was really, I, I really liked the results of this. But again, as you, in these examples already, you can see the problem of, of translating uh, 2D information into 3D. And this is one of the main problems we currently have in architecture when it comes to applying ideas of artificial intelligence into a design process. Very quickly, things that we use and that are also on the database uh, is things like the neural style renderer that, is, uh, that makes, it, it has a process where you have a 3D mesh uh, a rendering of the 3D mesh and a style image, and you can create a style transfer in the pixel space of these two images, right? And once you have that image, you can back propagate it to the 3D mesh to deform the mesh. And that's what you see here on the very right. That's the deformed mesh with the coloration of the style image. We use this technique in studio a couple of times 
to uh, with, with varying results, which are really interesting. Some are more deep, some are more shallow. This is one of uh, one of my fav really favorite examples um, where this has been uh, again applied between a modern and a baroque image, and the weight was really more towards the modern, which gives you this really interesting articulated modern uh, striated condition. Or images like this. Now, in our own practice, we have applied this idea successfully uh, also in a building project, uh, which is the robot garden, which is using 2D to 3D style transfer for a variety of elements. So again, using the same technique, we played around with a variety of plants and, and with uh, satellite images to create um, the main idea of uh, this project, which by the way, is around the corner of the school. So I hope Sooner or later, we can go there together and check it out. Some results are completely useless, like this one. Although I have to say, I love useless results because they give you ideas. That's something, by the way, that humans still are much better in than AIs. Uh, finding opportunity in a mistake and seeing how to use it uh, to your advantage. And this was the final result. And we're currently working also on creating some three-dimensional boulders and objects that will be situated within the site. Yeah. And this is currently the construction site. So you see the first phase is basically completed of the project. Now we're waiting for the Fab Lab to reopen more widely so that we can apply, um, we can actually start fabricating the boulders that will also uh, go on site pretty soon. More recently, uh, I've been researching so-called imaginary cities, uh, where I'm using neural, neural networks uh, to hallucinate cities on unexpected um, imagery. So for example, I did a lot of research on using style transfer to create cities on the moon. So we actually used uh, photographs uh, and graphics from the 19th century of the moon's surface and uh, existing city maps and see how we can use that as a tool to generate cities on the moon or generate landscapes on top of existing buildings. All of those are really considered rather tools that inspired us to do things than never final results. So in this case, for example, it was used as a starting point to create uh, the park areas between existing buildings. There's again the moon. Yeah. And there is more results I, I will show you in the course of this, uh, of this uh, course. Yeah? And we will discuss this in, in more detail. But this was basically like a short introduction into uh, artificial intelligence and how we are currently applying them in, uh, in architecture. And there is more to this, which I will also address in the course of, uh, of the course. All right, thank you.